Hello, this is Mrs. Standridge. We're here for another episode of Elijah of Buxton today. Now, yesterday, Elijah had to do, uh, had to face a lot of grown-up issues. Not only had Mr. Leroy died, but he discovered that Preacher was dead as well, and he found a bunch of runaway slaves who had been captured. They were treated terribly, chained to the wall, stripped of their clothing, beaten, and although Elijah of Buxton is a work of fiction, um, it it is very descriptive of um, things that could have actually happened in real life. Um, certainly, we know that slaves were horribly mistreated. So, we're going to find out what Elijah does about this situation that he's found himself in today. We're going to be reading chapters 22 and 23. Um, and then tomorrow will be our last chapter of Elijah of Buxton. So if you're in my sixth grade class and you haven't voted on our next book yet, I hope that you will do that. I sent out an email earlier in the week asking you to vote on what our next book would be. So I hope that you will take the time to go ahead and, and have your say in what you want to he hear next. All right. Chapter 22, Busting Free. I asked the woman, how many of them is it that's stealing you, ma'am? She said, they's that one pass out yon, and one what they calls Prater and his two boys, and a ornery dog. I calculated real quick, swallowed hard so's there wouldn't be no backing down, and said, ma'am, I can creep up on that man that's asleep and try to get the keys to those locks away without rousing him, and if he does wake up and I got to use this gun, then I got to use this gun. Then I'll let you all loose and we'll have a shotgun too and when those other slave hunters come running we all could... Ideas were jumping at me hard and fast and it seemed like the more harder and more faster they came, the more they were bumping into one another and the more confusing and worthless they were sounding, even to me. But I couldn't quit talking. Quitting talking was the same as quitting everything so I said, and when we get to Buxton the folks will welcome you and help you set up a farm. Even some of the white folks will help. And we're always looking out for people who are trying to get free. And when you get there, me and Cooter are going to ring the Liberty Bell around a hundred times. That comes out to twenty times for each one of you. And don't know patty rollers come there else they get tarred and feathered and run out of town on a rail. Or they disappear and ain't never heard from no more. And even the white folks that don't want us there get mighty riled when Americans come into Canada and try to tell them what to do. And once we get there, Emma Collins ain't going to have to trick you out of the woods because I'm going to bring you all the way there myself. And I I looked over at the four other people who were back to leaning their heads twixt their knees and breathing in a way that told me they weren't going to run nowhere. They didn't look like a bunch of tired, beat-down people no more. They were back to looking like five bundles throwed up against a stable wall. It was too much. Mr. Leroy dying, the preacher getting killed, the smells, the way the chains rattled and the naked folks looking so scared and whooped and tired, it was just too much. The stupid and confusing ideas quit coming and got their place took by a stinging in my eyes and a loosening in my nose and a choking in my throat. It weren't nothing but some powerful fragileness and when it comes, there ain't nothing you can do to stop it. It's like a, bowl, a ball got rolling down a hill. So all I could do was cry. Same as the chained up runaway boy that was younger than me, I quit talking, covered my eyes, and cried. The woman switched her baby to her left hand and covered my mouth with her right one. She'd done it gentle, but her hand was rough as an old barn wood across my face. She said, now, child, you got to settle down. You gonna wake that white man, then what gonna happen to you? We can't be having no talk about you sneaking up on no one in they sleep killing them. You shoots that thing off and every white man and boy in the country gonna be in here in no time. Besides, I sees you's a proper raised child. You can't be having no murders resting on your soul. I sucked some of the looseness out of my nose and said, 
But ma'am, how am I going to get you out of here? I know you're tired, but I got a horse outside that's the second fastest in all of Canada. And if we're careful, we can ride him hard. And maybe we could even borrow some of those horses there and wouldn't no one have to walk. And she laughed. My word, you sure is one bad little mister. First off, you're going to shoot a white man what's sleeping. Then you're going to help bust some slaves out their chains. Then you're going to steal some horses. Why, child, with all the mischief you got planned, white folks going to have to hang you once, once, then cut you down and string you up another two or three times. She rubbed her rough hand across my hair. Boy, there ain't going to be no horse stealing, and there ain't going to be no more running. Can't you see we're all run out? Besides, that drunk man over yon ain't got no keys. Massa Prater and his boys keep them, and keep them all separate, too. I remembered Mr. Taylor's sullied knife. I told her, I have this. I reached in my tote sack and pulled out the knife. I said, it wouldn't make no noise if I cut that drunk one's throat, and then took his shotgun, and then we could... She gave me a snatch and said, Hesh, look at you. How you gonna cut some man's throat? Tender as you is, I reckon you ain't never even cut the throat of no hog, has you? No, ma'am, but I ain't never felt this way for. Well, you ain't gonna start no throat cutting now. How old is you? I'm gonna be turning 12 in about 10 months, ma'am. 12 year old and free. And look at them proper clothes and shoes you wearing. And listen to the educated way you talking. It sure don't sound natural coming out of you, but you sound as educated as the missus children they selves. I knowed soon as I seen you, you ain't never been no slave. With that and you peering out of thin air like you done is why I weren't sure if you was a haint or not. But how are we going to get you free? You can't, child. But I got this knife. Maybe I can gouge those chains out of the wood they're mounted in. I looked where the chains were joined up to the wall. It weren't wood at all. It was rock. She gave me another snatch and said, Boy, stop. Them patty rollers ain't leaving nothing to chance. This ain't no amusement to them. This how they live. This what they do. If they don't know nothing else, they knows how to hold slaves and they knows how to keep us held. I said, Maybe if I pull the chains, I can... I snatched at where the chains were put into the rock. I can tug them free. Sometimes if you want something bad enough, your dreams get answered, and sometimes if you're scared enough, you get so strong you can do near anything. I pulled even harder on the chains and told her, Everybody in Buxton knows about how Mr. and Mrs. Alexander were clearing stones out of a field by themselves and had them load, loaded all up in a wagon, and he had to crawl underneath the wagon for something, and the wheel busted off, and his leg was pinned, and... There weren't no help round, and instead of having a fit, Mrs. Alexander got so afeard and mad that she picked up the whole end of the wagon herself so he could crawl out. A whole wagon full of stones, and she ain't nowhere near as strong as me. I snatched again, but it was like the chains were laughing at me. The woman reached down and held on to her ankle where the iron band was. She said, Honey, you gonna bust my leg before you bust that rock? Don't you think of getting afeard and wishing something would happen would make it true that these here chains would have turned to dust long ago? You think he wants to pull us free of these chains more than me and them Africans does? You think you got more strength and wanting in you than us? Than me? Child, you need to quit your agitating before you ends up shackled too. Some things just ain't meant to be changed. She was right. And soon as I knowed it, my legs quit working again, and I fell in a heap at her feet. She pulled me up and cradled my head in her arm. She wiped my eyes and said, Lord, if you ain't the swooningest thing I ever seen. She held my chin in her hand. Listen here. Don't you be fretting for us. You stop this crying. You just riling that African boy up, honey. You don't want to make things no worse for him, do you? I hadn't thought of that. I was just being selfish. She said, You can't know it, but you's the shiniest thing what we seen in a long, long, long time. Seeing you's the best, next best thing to see in Canada. Seeing you shows me the whole thing ain't no dream. Her baby coughed again, and she kissed it on the forehead, then kissed me on mine. 
She pushed me so she could look me right in my eye and said, Now, listen good. You gotta get on out of here. Before you go, that there pistol you has, is it real? It ain't no child's toy? No, ma'am. That's a real hundred-dollar gun. Do it work? Yes, ma'am. Do it got bullets? Yes, ma'am. It hard to shoot? No, ma'am. I saw the preacher shooting it, and it has got a kick. But if you're ready for it, it ain't much. But you do got to be strong. You ever shoot it afore? No, ma'am. But I shot the preacher's other gun, and it was just about the same. She smiled. Well, honey, I suppose if a little passing out freeborn thing like you can shoot a pistol, old Chloe can shoot it too. I looked at Mrs. Chloe's arms. They were like thick, twisted black rope. She grabbed my chin with her hand again, so I was looking her right in the eye, and she said, let me hold that gun. I pulled the mystery pistol out of my tote sack and put it in her hand. She said, it sure is lighter than it look. Now show me how it work. I showed her the same way the preacher had showed me. She said, that all? Yes, ma'am. How long after you shoot it one time for it set to shoot again? It's a revolver, ma'am. Soon as you pull the trigger, it'll fire again, but you gotta make sure you aim it real careful and hold your breath before you fire it the next time. And if it shoot a man one time, he gonna die? You hit him in the head or the chest, ma'am, he's gonna die. And if he don't die right off, he soon will. And if he don't die soon, he's going to spend the rest of his life wishing he had. And how many times this gun shoot for it through? That's a six-shooter, ma'am. She said that'd be just perfect. My mind did the totaling and counting the baby. There were six of them. Before I could ask her what she wanted to do, she grabbed my chin again and said, Now, child, you think you're going to be shooting something with this here pistol for you back in Canada? No, ma'am, but she said, but nothing. Maybe it'd be best if I keep this gun. It weren't a question. I looked at the way it was resting easy in her hand and knowed I couldn't have took it back if I wanted to. I said, yes, ma'am, maybe that's the best. I wished I could do something more. I didn't see how they were going to bust out of here with just the gun if they couldn't get off of the wall. And she was right. Once that gun commenced shooting... All the folks in this town would come running. And how far were they going to get with no clothes if they could bust out? And what if she weren't going to use the gun to shoot those slavers? What if she was really going to use the gun to shoot? I couldn't even think about that. She set the pistol behind her and nodded over to where the preacher was hanging and said, Before you go, you tell me what that man over yon done stole that make it worth y'all leaving Canada and coming down into this. I tried to look over at the preacher, but she pulled my face back to her. I told her everything that happened with Mr. Leroy and the preacher and Mrs. Holton's gold. She listened careful, then said, So now that your thief done died, is you heading direct back to Canada, or is they some other white men's throats around here you need to cut? No, ma'am, I'm going right back. I got an examination in Latin, so I got to be in school on Monday. She looked hard at me and said, School? She said it again, school? Yes, ma'am. She took the longest time to say anything else. She closed her eyes and squoze her baby. After a while, she smiled and said, here, come home, my child, whilst I get this here shackle adjusted. I think's all your tussling done about bust one of them scabs open. I said, I'm sorry, ma'am. I was only trying to. She said, hush, boy. My word, you sure do like to, the sound of your own mouth, don't you? Just be still and hold on to my child. I took the baby from her. It was a little girl. She said, I see you know how to hold a baby. Yes, ma'am. Some of the time I watch over the children in the nursery. The woman reached down with both hands and wiggled the iron round her ankle, then looked at me. She seemed surprised and said, Now that's truly amazing. I ain't never seen such a thing in all my days. Why, looky how that child just let you hold on to her. Look how easy she be resting in your arm. Looky there. The baby looked up at me. The woman acted like she wouldn't have been no more surprised if she'd just seen Moses himself part the Red Sea. She said, I ain't never. Why, I believe that gal do love you, boy. I done spoilt her something terrible, and she don't let no one hold her without she holler her life away. 
I do swear that baby love you. Why, I think she must believe you her brother. I ain't never seen such a thing my whole life. That child do feel you some kind of kin, cause she ain't never let no one but me and Kamal hold her so. She do, boy. Looky there, she really love you. Tears were coming out of the woman's eyes, but she was still smiling. I looked down at the girl. She was a stringy, sickly thing. I didn't think she loved me at all. I thought the only reason she weren't raising Cain was because even though she was being toted and weren't doing no walking with heavy chains on, she still looked just as beat and wore down and tired and whooped as her ma and pa and them other three Africans. But I couldn't figure out why this woman kept saying that this girl loved me. She said, you sees it, don't you, boy? You sees what I'm saying? Then I did. I started seeing some of what was going on. This was some of that talk that grown folks do, where they say one thing out loud, but you're supposed to be hearing lots of other things at the same time. This woman was treating me like I was groaned. She was acting like I could understand what she was meaning on the backside of her words. I tried hard as I could to see why she was pretending that me and the little girl were kin, but nothing would come, doggone it. This was just like one of them surprise examinations Mr. Travis bushwhacks us with in school. No matter how much you know on the subject, if he just starts asking all sorts of unexpected questions, your mind and brain seize up like a pump in the winter. Even if I did know what this woman was saying, it weren't going to come to me now. It weren't going to come because of the surprise. I felt something terrible, but she was wasting her time. I still couldn't speak or understand this grown folks' language. I couldn't think of nothing past how to get these folks freed, and it looked like there weren't nothing I could do. She tried again. Do you see how much she loved you, boy? I told her, No, ma'am, I don't see nothing like that. I reached the woman's baby back to her. She looked at me hard. Her hands were shaking when she took the girl from me. She cut out all the talking about love and held her baby tight. I was whooped. All I could do was look down and shove my hands in my pockets. Then, like I was getting a message, my fingers curled around the piece of paper in my pocket. I pulled it out and saw the name of the man who'd helped Mr. Highgate and who was looking after Mr. Leroy's earthly remainders, Mr. Benjamin Alston. Mr. Highgate told Pa he was a mighty good man. I knowed what to do. I whispered, Ma'am, it's come to me. I can get someone to help us. I'm going to be right back. She said, Boy, don't come back in here once you done left. You need to get back to Canada quick as you can. But ma'am, I ain't going to be alone. I know some men who'll help free you. They used to be slaves themselves. Once they hear about you, they'll get you out of here in no time at all. Listen to me, boy. Once you leave, don't you come back. Ain't no one going to help us. You just risking your own life for nothing. Get on back to Canada. I don't mean maybe. I picked up my tote sack and went to the door of the stable. I looked back at the woman, raised my right hand, and said, Ma'am, I swear on my ma's head that I'm going to come back with help. Don't you fret, we're all going to be in Buxton before the sun comes up. Chapter 23 Riding Hard Back to Buxton when I opened the stable door, I already had four chunking stones in my hand, just in case the bear-fighting dog had woke up. He looked like he was feeling a little better. His tongue had gone back in his mouth, and he was making a tiny whining sound, but he was still laying on his side with his eyes shut. I stepped over him and ran to Jingle Boy. We headed back to the tavern fast as we could. I kept hoping the men hadn't left. As I got closer, my spirits started lifting. I could hear they were still back there gambling. When I busted round the corner, I saw Mr. Alston squatting against a wagon wheel, watching the other men tossing the white spotty boxes. Ain't nothing like a hard galloping horse that'll get folks' attention. All the men jumped up like they'd got caught doing something wrong. I jumped off Jingle Boy and yelled, Mr. Alston, Mr. Alston, they got people they're taking back to slavery. They're about to march them out tomorrow. They got a woman and her baby and some Africans and a boy who ain't no older than me. But we gotta hurry. And they killed the preacher and got him hanging in the stable. 
Mr. Austin grabbed a hold of me. Slow down, boy. What are you saying? It took a second for my breathing to catch up to me. Then I said, There's four patty rollers that's kidnapped six people and are taking them down south. We can get them out. There's only one watching over them direct, and he's passed out from drinking. There's even a baby. We can get him out. He said, We can do what? The other men looked hard at me and Mr. Austin. We can get him out, sir. They're feeling pretty low, but once we get them going toward Buxton, I know they'll lively up some. One of the gambling men laughed and said, Man, pass me them dice. That boy crazy. Mr. Austin turned me loose and said, Son, you needs to get to Canada and tell your people about that man what died. How come you ain't left yet? Yes, sir, I will. But they're talking. They're taking these runaways out first thing in the morning. We got to free them now. I swore to Mrs. Chloe we'd get her out. Then I remembered how afeard the men were when they told me about the bear-fighting dog. I said, oh, you don't need to worry. I already knocked the dog cold. It's all right. Mr. Austin said, boy, I ain't playing. You needs to get on your horse and get your people. Ain't no one free and no one. This ain't Canada. This America. They ain't nowhere near the same. I do truly feel for them poor souls what's been caught, but they got laws here. If we was to get tangled up in this mess, they'd be selling us down the river. Ain't no one round gonna help. It was the sheriff what let them slave hunters lay over in that stable. One of the men said, Didn't no one bust me free when I was in Bama. Why am I gonna risk my neck for some folks I don't know what's stupid enough to get caught? I didn't know what to say. I turned to the man and said, But we're all... The one with the dice cuffed me upside my head. You heard the man. Get on out of here. Don't no one want to be here and none of you the mess you're talking? We ain't about to brook your nonsense. Besides, I'm on a roll. You messing with my game. I said, but they're near dead. They can't barely... The man punched me in the chest, knocking me down and sending the breath right out of me. Mr. Austin grabbed a hold of him and said, ain't no need for that. The man yelled at me, boy, you best get away from me before I kills you. We done told you, you ain't nothing can be done. You best get yourself back to Canada. We don't need none y'all freeborn Buxton fools coming up here making no trouble for us. I ain't about to go back and be no slave. I got up and started running back to Jingle Boy. I was so dumbstruck, I couldn't even cry. Jungle Boy snuffled at me when I got to him. I crawled up on his back. I headed him out toward the road and felt something leaping round in my belly. Next thing I knowed, I was leaning over and throwing up my supper from Ma and the milk from Cooter's Ma. I throwed up over and over till weren't nothing coming out of me but bitter water that I ain't got no recollection of drinking. Once that was gone, I throwed up air whilst my guts twisted and jumped. I know this didn't have nothing to do with the bear fighting dog hitting me in the side, nor the man punching me in the chest. I know this weren't nothing but my conscience talking to me, because I was going to have to break my promise to Mrs. Chloe. There weren't no sense in going back to the stable to try and free her and them Africans. The best thing I could do was ride Jingle Boy hard back to Buxton, and see what Ma and Pa would say we should do. But my conscience knowed that by the time I got down there and they put a posse together and came all the way back up here, those slavers would have took Mrs. Chloe away and there wouldn't be no way to figure out where. I had to choose twixt going back and telling her no one could help or getting to Buxton quick as I could because maybe, maybe something could get done. But my conscience was chewing at me and choking on my guts, cause it knowed that was a waste of time. The gambling man was right. Couldn't nothing nor no one help now. The tears finally came. I was going to listen to Mrs. Chloe. But she told me not to come back. I dug my heels into Jingle Boy's sides and pointed him south down the road to Buxton. All right, that's the end of chapter 23. We'll finish up the book tomorrow. I hope you can join me then. And then we'll get started on a new book next week. Bye.